In this video, we're going to explore why we would choose microservice architecture over a monolithic architecture, message brokers and their role they play in microservice-based applications, and also transports, the various types and which one to select for your particular business requirements. Let's start by seeing how the Facebook Messenger application could be structured using a monolithic structure. So we know that we have our client, and this can just be your mobile device or your computer. And we know that we have our API, which is where we're getting our data from, from the API connection to the database through the uh, Facebook servers. And we know that we're connecting between the client and the API using the HTTP protocol. So the client's making a request to get the data from the API and the API is giving back a response. So this is the regular HTTP protocol that drives the web. And if we dive a little deeper into the API, um, considering the Facebook API, we're thinking of some of the core features that could be inside of that. So inside of that, we might have authentication. We might have a messaging service or feature in this case. And we might also have a core service or feature. And then of course, we're gonna have some other uh, features, but I just wanna focus on these. So I wanna show you how we would structure this in a microservices architecture. So in a microservices architecture, of course, we still have the client. And we're making a HTTP request to an API gateway. So I'm just going to call this API. This is an API gateway. And then our API gateway is going to break each of these features into individual services. So we'll have an auth service here. We'll have a messages service here. And we'll also have our calls service here. So the key difference between the regular monolithic architecture and the microservice architecture is we're making a HTTP request to the API gateway, but we're going to pass on the request um, to the various microservice that we're calling. One of the problems with the monolithic architecture is that we can't scale all of the services uh, independently. So we can see that in the microservice architecture, for example, let's say one of our features was to get our friends list. Well, we only have to make that API call once, but we can see that in our messages microservice, we will be hitting that thousands of times potentially every single day. So that particular service is gonna be uh, worked disproportionately more than some of the other services. It also, splitting it up also gives you the advantage of um, different teams can work on different sections. So for very large organizations or complex projects, we can divide different uh, features into different uh, teams to work on each one. And then each of the microservices can be scaled up independently of one another in comparison to the monolithic architecture where everything is coupled together, you have to scale it all in one. It doesn't, it just doesn't scale as well as the microservice architecture. The microservices architecture has been embraced a lot in modern times. And this is thanks to the advancements in cloud computing and other containerization tools such as Docker. So Docker lets you easily create your containers, your microservices into separate services in a Docker file, for example. And then deploying this onto a cloud provider such as AWS, it helps you to auto scale each of these services and all of that complexity can be managed for you.
So the downside is that there is the extra complexity to the microservices architecture as a whole. And you really need to consider if it's something that you actually need. If you're a small business, medium business, st startup, uh, independent, you probably don't need the microservices architecture unless you have a particular use case for it. But if you are in a large team, uh, working for a big company perhaps, or working on a very sophisticated project that needs to be highly scalable, then the microservices architecture is a great way to solve that problem. So how do these services communicate with each other? We've seen that the client, it can communicate with the API using HTTP, and that could be on a certain port. So that could be on port 80, or as you see in node applications, perhaps 3000. But what happens at this service to service uh, communication? Well, it turns out that we don't actually use HTTP. Uh, we can, but we primarily we use TCP. So um, HTTP, it actually builds up on TCP. So if this is TCP, then the whole thing would be HTTP. And the difference is essentially where HTTP, it, the server, it exposes a particular port. Uh, TCP does not expose a port. It's just direct communication to the particular uh, computer. And also TCP is actually stateful. So it actually stores uh, information. The server needs to actually process some data associated with that. Um, to make sure that the request has been received. So it might look a little odd. Why would we sort of downgrade from the HTTP that the web uh, is built upon to a TCP connection, an earlier uh, version of a request response? In a monolithic architecture, we're making one single request to the server, and then we're sending a JSON response back to the client. However, in the microservices architecture, we're making a request to our API and we're passing that messaging all the way to different services. These services, they can communicate with one another. They can also call other services. So you can see that at each uh, step along the way, uh, there's the information, the data has to be processed. So for example, in the HTTP protocol, you have all of the HTTP headers. And you also, at every single stage, you have to process the headers and you also have to process all sorts of other things. And like, because you're getting the data in JSON format, you have to deserialize the JSON and then serialize the JSON at each of these um, different services that the messages uh, go across to. So for those reasons, HTTP is a little slower in the microservice architecture. And that's why we opt for using TCP to communicate between the microservices. The limitations of the TCP protocol is that there's an extra cost associated with storing data on B, but also while A is waiting for B, it actually will stop all of the other processes, which means that if A is hit a lot and is trying to make lots of requests, then, you know, it doesn't have the task capacity to be able to do that. If B were to crash for whatever reason, A will be continuously making requests to B and it basically won't stop and that will cause a lot of work that isn't really doing anything on our system. So to overcome these limitations, this is where message brokers come in. So a message broker is essentially a queue that sits between A and B. So let's just have a queue data structure, a simple one there in between A and B. And this can be in its own service. So let me just put that around it there. And the way it works is essentially if something happens, if A gets at some sort of task that it needs to handle, it pushes it to the queue. And in this case, it will send it to the front of the queue. 
And then when B is ready, when it's not dealing with any other task, it will be able to process that. So this does two things. The first is that it decouples the um, load from A and B to its own server in itself. And it also ensures that the um, responses are dealt with because you can get into a situation where um, it's not guaranteed that the request is going to be processed appropriately. Um, and message brokers help to be able to do that. So if you're familiar with the queue data structure or just a queue in general, um, it's a FIFO, first in, first out. So if there's another request that hasn't been processed, this will go to the next spot in the queue. And then when B is finally done doing this process, um, it can go onto this one here. So it means A, it, it's gonna get more and more requests and it won't just stop. It can process more and more requests and things will go into the queue and also B won't be overloaded too much because it just gets one of these requests from the queue and deals with it when it needs to. So this is the importance of message brokers. So if the queue gets really large, we can actually scale this because we can just simply add another worker and that can help dequeue some of these um, things that are waiting in the queue. Transporters are responsible for transmitting messages across microservice instances. There are quite a few of them, so I'll give a high level overview. So with the message brokers, there's these RabbitMQ, Redis, MQTT, Nats. Um, then there's something like Kafka, which deals with event streaming. And then GRPC, which is sort of its own thing. Uh, they're all sort of related though. They all allow for communication between the different services. So let's start with RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is the most popular and widely used um, transport. And it deals with complex routing. Um, but it's also really reliable and highly available. And it's quite flexible. So it can work for, you know, many system requirements that you might have for your particular system. Redis is a in-memory data store. It's very lightweight and very performant. It is fire and forget. So if a publisher publishes a message and there's no subscribers to subscribe to the message, then it's possible that the data will be lost. Um, it's a great option if you're looking for speed and performance and can do with a little bit of data loss. MQTT is good for devices that have low bandwidth, high latency and unreliable connections or networks. NATS is optimized for performance. It's often used for its ease of use to deploy and scale, but there is some um, issues where there's message deliveries aren't always guaranteed in comparison to something like RabbitMQ. Kafka is a distributed event streaming platform. It's used to be able to handle high volumes of messages and it's used primarily as a live event um, streaming platform. gRPC is Google's implementation of Remote Procedure Core. It allows functions to be called from microservices or other services as if they were local. gRPC is fast, um, but if anything happens to any of the services, uh, it has a more catastrophic effect than some of the previous uh, transports that we've discussed. We have discussed microservices, message brokers, and various transports in this video. In the next video, we're going to do the practical implementation of the RabbitMQ microservice with Nest.js. So please subscribe to my YouTube channel to stay tuned for that one. And thanks so much for watching. Cheers.